So today I'll talk about uh, spectroscopic and H1 surveys and uh, the overlap of science that we can do here for the uh, gal spec uh, survey. So um, what H1 surveys need is redshifts. So this is H1's motivation to go look for spectroscopic redshifts. And that's mostly what I'll be talking uh, about. So this is from the perspective of H1 surveys. And there's three science reasons that we would like to get these. One is there are OH masers masquerading as H1 detections in our data cubes. The second one is that we'd like to combine low signal to noise uh, H1 spectra into population uh, wide stacked detections. And then low mass H1 at high redshift might actually be lensed by a, a strong gravitational lens at slightly lower redshift. And of course we want star formation and metallicity, but really the thing that the, the main reason that we want to go out for, uh, for these uh, optical redshifts is uh, we want to get spectroscopic redshifts uh, for our targets that we, uh, that we observe in H1. So the new H1 redshifts that are now happening, um, so these are the 21 centimeter um, emission lines from um, atomic hydrogen, is um, the uh, Wallaby and Wide Survey with the ASCAP and Apertif tel uh, telescopic instrument. Uh, so these are mostly all sky. There's the Medium Deep Survey with Apertif. There's Dingo on ASCAP, which are sort of like intermediate, uh, the trade-off between how much area is covered and uh, depth. There is Chile's, which is done on the cosmos field. And then there is uh, La Duma, they're looking at the distant universe with the Meerkat array, which is, uh, I'm one of the three PIs for that show, survey. So there is sort of a, uh, um, a, a, the usual wedding cake of uh, surveys that are now being conducted with uh, SKA pathfinders and precursors. And this is trade off between deep fields and all sky. Uh, all of these are in L band with the exception of uh, La Duma, which also has a UH, a very large UHF component, so we're actually going much deeper. So our first science mo motivation is OH masers or OH mega masers. Um, so these are really large, amazing uh, complexes at in star forming uh, galaxies, and that 1800 megahertz hydroxyl uh, line will redshift into our L band and then into our UHF band. So Haley Roberts has uh, just given a really great paper on that, uh, showing that the number, our sensitivity for OH uh, masers goes, I mean, that goes up over with redshift, but uh, uh, these new tiers of surveys are very, very sensitive to uh, these OH masers because they're going deeper. Uh, the, one of the first OH masers was already reported in uh, by Kelly Hess in 20, uh, just, uh, two months ago. So these deepest are looking at the distant universe with the Meerkat array. That's actually the one that's really going to run into those OH masers. Uh, and so this is uh, 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 Robert's uh, prediction for um, how many of these OH masers are we expecting to get and how many of those compared to the number of H1 detections we're going to get. So you need an independent redshift in order to distinguish whether or not the, this is the line that you detected is an OH maser at lower redshift or if it's uh, um, or if it's the uh, the H1. Um, so in order to get the to get those out, we need independent redshift. So for that alone, we have a very good reason to go out and match up with optical surveys. As you can see, so by the time you get to about redshift one and a half, the fraction of OH masers versus H1 detections is getting close to unity. Um, so we're going to get quite a number of these. We're expecting quite a number of these. Apart from that, um, the H1 detections are really, really tricky. Uh, and that means that we have uh, a high number of low signal to noise spectra of uh, the same population of galaxies. So instead of doing individual measurements, you can also do this for a population, say uh, mid-sized elliptical galaxies or LMC-like galaxies in the uh, at, at lower redshift. So um, you have all these, um, uh, non-detections or very low signal-to-noise detections. And so what you then need, if, if you have a whole bunch of positions for these galaxies and redshift, so you already know where they should be in the cube, you can shift them all to the same rest frame. This is what we did in the middle panel here. And then you can sum them all together. Um, so instead of getting a individual detection for each of them, we're getting sort of an averaged out um, 
uh, H1 spectrum for a particular population of galaxies at a particular epoch. That's still extremely useful to know, so you can get what's the average uh, gas content of a certain kind of galaxy in a certain kind of epoch. Uh, and so you can maximize your science if you have enough uh, optical redshifts. And as you can see, you do need to have good velocity information. So high quality redshifts are preferred. So GRISM doesn't quite cut it because that still smooths out the, uh, um, uh, the spectrum in velocity. And so you need something that is like an R of uh, a few thousand uh, redshift. You can't do this with, op uh, with photo Z's or with GRISM spectra. Uh, so you can, uh, the more you add, of course, more is better. So uh, this is a main driver for us to go out and ask for as many optical spectra as we can, because you need um, several, uh, several hundred, if I remember correctly, uh, optical uh, spectra in order to get a good uh, H1 signal to noise. Depends a little bit on how deep your cube is and all that, uh, but uh, we want to get a good mean spectrum, and for that we need to get. Uh, to stack many, 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 many uh, galaxies. And so we have plenty of targets. We have plenty of spectra in our cube. We just need to get the optical redshifts. So this is, a, this is the main driver. The OH uh, masers are already a good reason. This is the second excellent reason why we want optical spectra to go with our H1 uh, surveys. And the last one is the one that I got interested in a little bit uh, more recently because uh, gravitational lenses. So gravitational lenses are typically, we think of this Hubble picture here, uh, and you can identify those uh, mainly for, through three ways. One, you can see the signal of both this star forming galaxy at higher redshift and a, and a quiescent galaxy at lower redshift in, an, in a spectrum. So if you see a mixed spectrum, a blended spectrum like that, that's a good indication that this is a uh, an, actual, an active gravitational lens, so one that you can use for gravitational lensing studies. Otherwise, you can just ask a whole bunch of people to look at high quality images. Uh, however, you then already have to have high quality image where the arcs are pretty clear, or you can get machine learning to identify candidate uh, strong lensing events for you. Uh, and so all three of them are currently being employed to find new uh, gravitational lenses. However, the blended spectra is the one with the highest uh, um, clean samples, so the cleanest samples. The problem is that if your um, spectroscopic aperture is smaller than the actual arc, then you're going to miss them in the, um, in the spectroscopic survey. So there is a, there's a high level of complementarity between the blended spectra, the citizen science, and machine learning. Um, what we've noticed is that, however, if, if there's they're they're all in, if they're enclosed or if they're um, at least partially enclosed by your spectra, then then, then you can pick those up. So uh, what my student uh, Sean Knabel found was that if we look at the gamma fields, we can get um, about equal numbers from spectroscopy and machine learning, uh, and this, but the spectroscopy and the machine learning find different lenses. The machine learning finds the ones that are you know, big on the sky and so very clearly visible. And the spectroscopy is actually more sensitive to ones that are more compact because they are actually, the, the signal from both galaxies is, is contained within the fiber. And then citizen science somewhere sits in between. Um, we kind of went in with the idea that, hey, this would be a neat way to confirm, um, you know, spectroscopic candidates with machine learning or to confirm machine learning ones with citizen science. But as it turns out, there's hardly any overlap. Uh, simply because the, uh, the selection effects are such that they basically are mutually exclusive. Um, he also looked at uh, how big of a sample, how, how big of a sample from strong lenses do you get as you improve your spectroscopic surveys. And you can improve a spectroscopic survey by either going deeper or you can pack more spectra in a field. And so what you see is that the initial strong lensing um, searches, that's uh, slacks for the masses, slacks, bells, these are all based on basically uh, versions of a Sloan Digital Sky Survey spectroscopic. And so they all store to stay in that corner, gamma already is a, has a higher density of spectra and is going deeper. So we actually get a higher number of 
uh, candidate lenses per square degree. So that goes up. And as we go to the next generation, which is devils, and the next generation after that, which is waves and orchids, we sort of expect the number of lenses in even a given field to improve as we are adding spectra and we are adding spectral densities. And so we actually end up uh, finding more and more of these blended spectra. They still tend to be only a few maybe a tenth of a percent of a survey. So, uh, but we are now talking millions of spectra anyway. So we're talking pretty big samples of uh, strong lenses. Uh, we're also can use that to flip that around and go like, well, what happens if, um, if I have a candidate from, um, from uh, machine learning, can I go back to my spectroscopic survey and see if I can see the, the double signal there? So um, the, the thing that's helping us is that most fibers are not perfectly on the galaxy. And so they tend to you know, in, encompass a little bit of the, um, of the lensing model of the, sorry, of the lensing caustic. And so we get a little bit of signal. The signal is lower but it's still there. So you can go, here's our candidate list of uh, strong lenses uh, from machine learning. Can we see a second, second signal in the uh, spectroscopic surveys? And so that's often enough to confirm them. And so we are actually confirming these now. Uh, Sean is writing this paper up now. Um, so uh, this means we're very much limited by how much redshift information a given H1 survey or a given uh, uh, target field actually has at the moment, right? So because one of the reasons that we want to get a strong lens, for example, is to look for that H1 further out. So um, the current coverage is still incomplete in both redshift, field of view, uh, target list. Uh, they're either low resolution, so this, the, the green points here are all uh, uh, grism and so, well, well, we'll give it a go. Um, it's a, the usual trade-off between the number of spectra you have and the spectral resolution that you can provide. And so if you, um, we can try GRISM, but honestly, I think we'll end up smearing out our H1 signal if we're doing the stacking. So we need higher redshift and we need to go to near infrared in order to get the full, um, uh, the full red target redshift range. So uh, one, th one more thing that I want to point out is that um, there's a reason the um, uh, Laduma um, logo is the trumpet, the Vuvuzela. Uh, we, that's how, how we talk about our data cube because, um, because our field of view now goes as lambda over D. Um, by the time you, end, uh, you reach the end of the UHF band, um, the field of view is a lot bigger. And so uh, by redshift 1.4, exactly the redshift that you need more stacked results because that's where the signal to noise goes uh, is the lowest. We also have the biggest field of view. So we have the biggest patrol area. So we have the biggest need for spectra and we have the biggest need, uh, area to get them over. So sort of the, 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 the need for spectra goes up with redshift um, in these surveys. So the good news is that uh, we started with uh, uh, the gamma survey here because that has a high completeness level and uh, high completeness as I hopefully shown already is, is important for this kind of research because we want to get lenses, we want to stack. You can't uh, have uh, uh, the fiber collisions get in your way of your science here. And so uh, the, the, um, the observational approach by gamma devils and, and, uh, and later waves is that to uh, have a high completeness in your patrol field. And so this is important uh, because then we can go down in stellar mass, we can stack in lower at lower masses, uh, we can stack at higher redshifts. Uh, all these things are going to be very complementary for the H1 uh, science. Uh, and so this is hopefully going to uh, improve matters quite a bit. Um, and so that also uh, uh, brings me to my first, you know, science uh, result, which is that I was looking for blended spectra in the first Devils uh, data release. And so we're looking for these um, uh, ones where there is a second peak, S2 is basically the cross correlation peak for a second redshift compared to the other two. So there's a relatively high contrast uh, second peak. And we look for those and we look where the second redshift ends up. And so we are already finding blended spectra in, for example, ECDF South is the uh, Laduma target field, but there is also XMMLSS and Cosmos which um, uh, are targets for other Meerkat surveys. So uh, in the L band, we can start looking at these lens effects as well as stacking and OH masers. 
Um, and so these things go to higher redshifts, they go to lower masses, so they're actually quite interesting lenses, and there's, so there's a good odds for having uh, H1 magnified. And so that's a you know, first kind of science goal that we can go after. Of course, um, DEVILS is a rather small field, control field. Uh, we also have our own uh, AAT uh, uh, survey, and so that was done uh, in order to get some, you know, we, we are just hungry for spectra, really. And so um, this is another set of uh, spectra that we have been looking for strong lenses and that we are prepping for. Uh, uh, near future stacking results. So uh, the Duma is going to use spectra for three reasons. It's going to go and identify OH masers. It's going to use um, the blended spectra to identify where a gravitational lens could potentially be found. And we're going to use the whole thing uh, for all our low signal to nose H1 to stack everything uh, as we have moved everything up to the optical redshift. So optical redshift really, really work with, are really, really important to go with um, um, uh, H1 cubes. And these are the three science topics that you can then tackle with them. So H1 and optical spectroscopic surveys, they are interesting science hiding in the intersection. So there's the OH masers, mega masers, which um, I haven't talked about that much because I'm not an expert, but I do know that they occur in uh, ULURGs, they occur in uh, strong, um, interactions or basically mergers. So they're an independent merger um, estimate. Uh, and so if you have the optical redshift and the H1, or at least an, an what you think was an H1 line, and it turns out it's an OH maze, mega maser, that's a way to get uh, ongoing merger, mergers in uh, over time. So that's one science topic that will have, uh, that will benefit from having good optical redshifts on uh, the uh, survey fields for H1. We can maximize the H1 science itself by stacking all the results with a low signal to noise spectra, and we can identify strong gravitational lenses and then find the uh, strongly the magnified H1 at higher redshift. And of course, we'll want the star formation and metallicities from the uh, line strength as well. But these are the three topics that I can immediately uh, think of if I, if I think about H1 and optical spectroscopic surveys. Do you have any questions for me? Do you want to get in contact? There's my email and there's my um, uh, Twitter handle. So I'm always happy to chat to, to you. Uh, so I'll stop it there and thank you so much.